Good morning and welcome to Freedom Church. Today we're holding a remembrance service. Today is the day we remember and give thanks to those people who died while in active service. Remembrance Day started just after the First World War, November the 11th, 1920. So we will be remembering those who fell in that war. And then the Second World War and all other active service from then on. It is a time to remember those people who sacrificed. We dedicate this time to those people who died fighting to protect our nation. It is also a time when we give thanks to Father God, who in the ultimate sacrifice gave Jesus Christ for each one of us. But first, may I read some scripture. Psalm 103, 1 to 5 goes, Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. And at the last three verses, it goes on. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works, everywhere in his domain. Praise the Lord, my soul. Just a wonderful uh, psalm, that one. And I'd just like to read Isaiah 40. I'm going to read the first few verses and then the last few verses as well. Isaiah 40, 1 to 5. Comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and claim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the wilderness says, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight the paths in the desert, a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up and every mountain hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken this. This is still Isaiah 14, it's the verses 27 to 31. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my cause is disregarded by my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow weary. And his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increase the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and the young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Such encouraging words from the Lord. Let us sing, praise my soul, the King of heaven.
And I'll just say a prayer now. Father God, in all your ways, in all your being, you are love. To show us the height, breadth and depth of that love, you sent your son, Jesus Christ. In his life, death and resurrection, Jesus showed us what it means to love those who suffer. This day, we bring before you in our prayers those who suffer and those who carry deep wounds of war. For those whose scars are of the body, grant them your rest. For those whose scars are of the spirit, grant them your comfort. And for those whose scars are of the mind, grant them your peace. Lord Jesus, you alone are the Prince of Peace. You offer each one of us peace which passes all understanding. We humbly ask that you bless the peacemakers and that you still the hands of those who seek only to make war. By the power of your Holy Spirit, bring your heavenly peace into our humanly chaos your heavenly order into a humanly turmoil and bring your heavenly will to rule in all our lives. In your name, we ask this, Lord, our creator and our redeemer. Amen. As an act of remembrance, let us all just stand. These are great words that start off our Two minute silence. They shall grow. Wo- wo- they shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn them. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. We're just going to play the last post, and at the end of that, we will hold two minute silence.
the end there, we played the Rival. And these words, when you go home, tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow, we gave our today. While we're standing, let us just say the Lord's Prayer together, shall we? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now for our second hymn. Eternal Father, strong to say. asking myself the other week, why is the tomb of the unknown soldier so important? The unknown soldier represents all missing and unknown service members who served and made the ultimate sacrifice. They not only gave their lives, but also their identities to protect our freedoms. The British grave of the unknown warrior holds an unidentified member of the British Armed Forces killed on the European battlefield during the First World War. He was given a state funeral 
and buried in Westminster Abbey, London on the 11th of November, 1920. The idea of the tomb of the unknown warrior was first conceived in 1916 by the Reverend Ara Railton, who while serving as an army chaplain on the front of the Western Front, had seen a grave marked by a rough cross which bore the pencil written legend, an unknown British soldier. He subsequently wrote to the Dean of West Westminster uh, uh, in 1920, proposing that an un unidentified British soldier from the battlefields in France be buried with due ceremony in Westminster Abbey amongst the kings to represent the many hundreds and thousands of empire that died. The idea was strongly supported by the Dean and the Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, at that time. And, and this is what he wrote later on. The cenotaph is a token of our mourning. As a nation, the grave of the unknown warrior is a token of our mourning as individuals. Suitable remains were exhumed from various battlefields along the front and they were laid to rest in St. Paul, near Arras, France. And on the night of the 8th of November, 1920, there were four bodies in that room. And the, they were just in the chapel alone. The remains then were placed in four plain coffins. Each body was covered with a Union Jack and placed on a stretcher at midnight Brigadier General Watt entered the room and randomly selected one of those bodies, just touching the Union Jack with his hand. The three remaining were removed. The coffin of the unknown warrior then stayed at the chapel overnight and on the afternoon of the 9th November, it was transferred under guard and escorted with troops lining the route from St. Paul to the medieval castle within the ancient citadel of Boulogne. A company from the French 8th Infantry Regiment recently awarded the Legion d'Honneur en masse stood vigil overnight. The following morning, Two under undertakers entered the castle library and placed the coffin into a cask of oak timbers. And these oak timbers came from trees from Hampton Court Palace, London. The casket was banded with iron. A 16th century sword chosen by King George V. He personally chose it from him. The royal collection was placed on top and surmounted by an iron shield bearing the inscription, a British warrior who fell in the Great War of 1914-19 for king and country. The casket was then placed into a French military wagon drawn by six black horses. At 10.30am, the church bells of Boulogne tolled. The massed trumpets of the French cavalry and the bugles of the French infantry played the last post. Then the mile long procession, led by 1,000 local school children and escorted by a division of French troops, made its way down to the harbour. At the quayside, Marshal Fox saluted the casket before it was carried up the gangway of the destroyer HMS Verdum and piped aboard with an admiral's call. The Verdum slipped anchor just before noon and was joined by an escort of six battleships. As the flotilla carrying the cars closed in on Dover Castle. It received a 19-gun field marshal salute. It was landed 
at Dover Marine Railway Station, the Western Docks, on the 10th of November. For nearly the final leg of the journey from Dover to London, the unknown warrior was placed on board a train. The body of the unknown warrior was carried uh, to London in South Eastern and Chatham Railway and a general utility van, and it was numbered 132. During the journey, the crowds gathered at every station along the route. This is an excerpt from the Daily Mail of the 11th of November 1920. The train thundered through the dark, wet, moonless night. At the platforms by which it rushed could be seen groups of women watching and silent, many dressed in deep mourning. Many an upper window was open and against the golden square of light was silhouetted clear cut and black, the head and shoulders of some faithful watcher. The train went to Victoria Station, where it arrived on Platform 8 at 8.32pm that evening and remained there overnight. The next morning, crowds began to arrive early and on the 11th of November 1920, there were soon six or seven deep on the procession that from Victoria to the Cenotaph and then on to Westminster Abbey. So the casket was then placed into a gun carriage again, the Royal Horse Artillery draw and drawn by six black horses again through immense silent crowds. As the cortege set off, a further field marshal salute was fired in Hyde Park. At 10.40, the king took up his position facing the cenotaph, which was covered in two huge Union flags at that time. On the east side of the cenotaph, the gun carriage carrying the unknown warrior came to rest in front of the king. The king saluted and placed a wreath of red roses and bay leaves onto the coffin. And with a handwritten card, which said, in proud memory of those warriors who died, unknown in the Great War, unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold they lived, George R.I. At 11 o'clock, as Big Ben began to chime, the king faced the cenotaph and touched a button which released the flags, veiling the monument. As the sound died away, everyone fell silent for two minutes. After the last post sounded, the official party formed up behind the coffin for the solemn journey from the Cenotaph to Westminster Abbey. The unknown warrior was granted a full state funeral. The only time that this honour has been bestowed on an anonymous person or a representative of a whole group of people. The cortege was then followed by the king, the royal family and ministers of state to Westminster Abbey where the casket was born into West Nave of the Abbey, flanked by a guard of honour. And also they had around them 100 recipients of the Victoria Cross. The guests of honour were a group of about 100 women. This is most touching. They had been chosen because they had each lost their husbands and one or all their sons in the war. Every woman, so bereft, who applied for a place, got it. The coffin was then interned in the far western end of the nave, only a few feet from the entrance, in soil bought from each of the main battlefields. 
Servicemen from the armed forces stood guard as tens of thousand mourners filed past silently. Immediately after the grave was covered with the actors, Pal and the Union flag, the four sentries were mounted at each corner of the grave. Members of the public queued for hours to file past. When the grave was closed on the 18th of November, seven days later, an estimated 1.2 million people had visited the abbey and filed past the coffin in silence. The ceremony appears to have served as a form of catharsis for collective mourning on a scale not previously known. The grave was capped with a black Belgian marble stone, the only tombstone in the abbey on which it is forbidden to walk on. And it features this inscription, who was composed by the Dean of Westminster at that time, and it is engraved with brass melted down from wartime animation. It says, Beneath this stone rests the body of a British warrior, unknown by name or rank, brought from France to lying among the most illustrious of the land and buried here on Armistice Day, 11th of November, 1920, in the presence of His Majesty, King George V, his ministers of state, the chiefs of the forces and a vast concourse of the nation. Thus, I commemorate D, the final multitudes, who during the Great War of 1914-18 gave the most that man can give, life itself. For God, for king and country, for loved ones, home and empire, for the sacred cause of justice and the freedom of the world. They buried him among the kings because he had done good towards God and towards his house. Isn't it fitting that the last sentence is a paraphrase of 2 Chronicles 24, 16. And it's taken from the story of Jehonabed. And they buried him in the city of David among the kings because he'd done good in Israel, both towards God and towards his house. And there are four inscriptions uh, around, and they are taken from the New uh, Testament, and they are, The Lord knoweth them that are his. And that's from 2 Timothy 2.19, and that's placed at the top. And on one side, an unknown, yet well-known dying, and behold, we live. And that's from 2 Corinthians 6, 19. From the opposite side, greater love hath no man than this. John 15, 13. And the last one at the bottom. In Christ shall all be made alive. Amen. As we remember these people who gave their lives in service to save us, I cannot help my thoughts turning to Christ, that he died for each one of us. What an incredible gift we all have, the gift of life, now because of those who fought against injustice in the many battles and wars, and the chance of eternal life with Jesus Christ. That is just absolutely incredible. Thank you for enjoy, for joining us on this Our Remembrance Day service.